All right, I think we can slowly start. The topic of this lesson is to talk about literally all kind of tests there are. We won't go into detail to any of those tests. There is one kind of test that we will go into uh, a bit of a demo, actually uh, two kind of tests, uh, end to end and um, well, end to end BDD and uh, um, mutation tests. But today's topic is to cover literally all kinds of tests that there are. And there are quite many kinds of tests. If you would count, I counted 22, maybe there are more. But my goal is to just uh, um, show the kinds of tests there are and ways other than just unit and integration testing, how you can ensure that your software does what it should and behaves how it should. And there are two big categories for tests. Just like there are requirements, there are tests for those two categories and the categories are functional and non-functional. And I'd like to start with a commercial from Windows 98. So let's look at it. And this should illustrate functional requirements. So what you saw is just some of the highlights that demonstrate what Windows 98 could do back in the days. How, so basically they highlighted their functional requirements, what the software could do. So functional requirements tell us what a system or software can do. Functional tests test functionality of a software. The first type that we're already familiar with is unit testing. And I'll just repeat myself. We test, um, we test things in isolation. Why do we need, so how do we isolate things? Basically we mock everything usually and test only one thing. How do we, uh, why do we need unit testing? Well, the main reason why we need them is just a proof that our code works and localization of bugs. If something is broken, if it's a proper unit, you can immediately point your finger. That's the spot that's broken, fix it. Living documentation is another reason why we need unit tests because you can just read under what condition test works. Though the living documentation thing could be applied to other kinds of tests if given they're written properly. One more video because sometimes there might be um, a confusion. How is integration test different from unit test? So let me play this video. Basically what you just saw means that lock by itself works. You can lock it and unlock it, but if you add it on a door and fit it in a socket, it, it just doesn't fit. 
it's too loose and so the door itself doesn't work. Integration testing, unit test in this case would be a door without a lock or lock itself. And integration testing would be door with a lock in a, 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 inside a wall. And we're testing if the whole thing works, installed. Basically testing components if they work as is. Sometimes um, we want that certainty if it, it, if it works, because we cannot just presume that, you know, stuff that is mocked tested separately will work in union. Also, um, for this one, uh, sometimes integration itself can be a complex thing. Like it's not just using the things, but it's also the way the things get connected, get wired up. That might be complex by itself. So it needs to be tested. System test. Basically everything is built and you just demonstrate how the thing works as is. You don't demonstrate this scenario, the workflow, you rather just demonstrate or highlight what it can do, what the features are. And um, the example that you see here is probably not the best one, but it's funny nevertheless. It's not the best one because it shows probably more stress testing or load testing or something similar, but system testing is not a very good example of it. Though my point of having Tesla failed experiment here is that they were showing the full system. And when you use it, and when you testing a system, you're testing its different features. A working system, no longer components, no longer units, but a working system. And this basically means that all the integrated features are combined into one running bootstrap hosted system. A car is a system, a house is a system, our software is a system. A cluster of services is also a system. And that is system test. A different thing from a system test, like almost the same, but slightly different is when we take scenarios, what needs to be done to achieve thing X. And from start to finish, we do those things step by step and see if it works. If we follow a scenario that is called end to end. If we follow a scenario that is executed on a system that is end to end. If we just interact in with an individual step for a system, that's called system test. But end to end is a special case of system test when we apply a scenario, a flow. Why do we need end to end? Well, we want to know if stuff not only works when it all comes together, but if a certain flow doesn't break things. And there can be multitude of problems. Like it, it can be drastically different. Um, uh, running the whole thing through a flow compared to just running individual steps, not in the flow. It's a difference. So end to end therefore is often just called from a UI side because UI is the best way of how you show actual flow, the front end. Um, and you basically interact with UI in order to verify if UI and, and data behaves as expected.
Smoke testing is a cool type of testing to basically answer the question, is it on yet? For example, how, how would you check if system is booted? How would you know that a service is running? How do you know that your car engine is running? H how can you check it? Well, probably if you turn the key and hear the vroom vroom from the engine, that is good enough of an indication um, for um, uh, on the, for thinking if the service is running, if the car engine is running, that means the car itself is likely to move. And that is kind of an instinctive way of saying that the car works. Maybe not completely, but um, at least from first look, it seems to work. If we hear the engine sounds, it's working. So it's very similar with smoke testing. It's like a smoke signal that the service makes. We cannot say if everything is working, but at least we know that it's running. Regression testing is uh, a kind of test to prevent new bugs from uh, entering the software when we fix it. Imagine. You know, there is a saying that we fixed one bug and there's 99 more bugs after that bug was fixed. So regression tests aim to prevent that. You basically test software with a goal for not testing already existing things, but for making sure that um, other things were not broken. So uh, sorry, you are testing existing things, but the new piece of software that you introduced, that is not being tested. The focus of testing is the old things. And sanity testing is very much like uh, smoke tests. You're basically testing if the system is running, but on top of that, you test if core functionality is running. So here, you can see a picture with a horse on an opposite on an opposite side of a chariot and a person not really in the right position basically the whole setup is there but sanity test would fail because well how is the person supposed to move if core functionality is to move forward well i don't see how that happens so the test fails Basically, sanity testing is for testing your MVP, minimum viable product. Interface testing is basically testing for errors. What happens to software when you make it fail? What happens if you send wrong uh, request? What happens if you make it fail? Uh, what message, what error message comes back to you and is, is it, is it able to, does it handle errors in a consistent way? Those are the things that interface testing tries to cover. And in the picture, you see what the tester would do in this case, they would deliberately try to break system and get hurt in the process. And that's the way to test it. Now let's move on to non-functional tests and let's start with this picture. Jimmy is a cool kid and he has a cool lady as well. And he has four wheels as his lady demanded him. His lady wanted uh, to be picked up for the dance and she wanted uh, to be picked on in a vehicle with four wheels and together they were supposed to move uh, in that vehicle to the dance. So basically functional requirement was to be able to travel in four wheels. Actually functional requirement was to be able to travel, 
non-functional requirement was four wheels. And, um, well, the lady was expecting a car, but the boy ended up coming with a cart. So <laughs> the lady should have been more precise with defining the requirements. With what was the boy supposed to arrive? So be careful with your non-functional requirements. And what are non-functional requirements used for? They define not what the system can do, but how it should behave. How? It could mean many things, like how should it look? How should it feel? How should it behave? Under what conditions? Um, how does it take uh, lots of load? Can it be penetrated, exploited, and many more things that we will look at now. Stress testing. What happens if you put system under pressure? What happens if you send many requests? What happens if lots of data come in? What happens if you have simultaneous sessions? How does the system handle that? And what is the breaking point? And is that breaking point good enough for the production environment. These are the things that we try to figure out for system test, uh, for stress testing. And here you can see two poor nails and their brother. Uh, the nail is supposed to get, um, get hammered and he did get hammered. Uh, with enough power. So there was a bang and he was gone in the floor. Performance testing is very similar to, uh, uh, to stress testing because um, it does similar things, but the goals are different. It basically measures how long did the responses take. Um, does performance, does the system have performance issues? And can we, can we, or should we improve it? Is it good enough for production? Those are the questions that performance, that performance tests try to answer. So it, it, it would basically be a benchmark of some sorts to see how long a request took and if it's acceptable. Load testing, as the name implies, is basically related to loading our software with um, big like loads of data, loads of sessions, many, many things at once and see how it handles the load. For example, does this, the system handle 100 uh, uh, asynchronous requests happening simultaneously? What happens? Does it uh, does it handle all asynchronously? Does it handle it synchronously? What are what is the specification? Does it crash under such load? Can it support a hundred users, a thousand, million? What are the requirements? And this is what load testing does. It tests exactly that. Security testing, as the name implies, basically prevents looks for exploits, determines risks, and eliminates highest risks that we are not allowed to pass through in production. We scan for vulnerabilities. We then inspect. Um, so basically there are scans like Fortify scan for security to pinpoint common security issues in code. On top of that, a human is needed to inspect what networks we have, if our services protected from, from the outside in terms of networks. And of course, there's a term called white hat hacker, which deliberately tries to break our system to exploit and penetrate it. And basically through finding exploits and exploiting our own system, we can determine risks and fix them. Volume testing is another very similar kind of performance testing, except this time it's 
uh, the amount of data that matters. It's not the amount of users, the amount of sessions, but like the data itself that can happen at a time. For example, can our um, system handle a request with a million thousand of lines or million thousand of symbols? Um, how does it behave differ differently or slower or faster if, if we handle 1000 symbols request? So we need to understand how volume of data affects the system and um, how, how much do we support? And we need to prove that we support the amount of data that we tell that we support. That is volume testing. Localization testing is very easy to understand. Basically, does my software that is uh, working in, let's say, the Netherlands, does it work also in the USA? It's uh, just checking how software works in different regions because uh, date formats are different, number formats are different, and based on software requirements, we might need to make sure that our software either works consistently all across or that it works, that is, that is properly localized or that it simply doesn't crash under a different localization, if it matters. And mostly it does, because software is more often global than not. Recovery tests is well, a way to see if by unplugging your software, if turning it off, it can be turned back on during something important. If something important happens and it, the system has a hiccup, is it able to recover? It's literally like a, a phoenix, can it go to ashes and from ashes back to itself? Another example is what happens if we close the browser? Is the session still there? And so on. In some cases, it might not matter. In other cases, it's critical. And therefore, in those cases where it's critical, it will most certainly be tested with recovery test tests. Reliability tests. How does our software behave in different environments? Can we reliably say that a software that works uh, in, um, let's say, Windows, does it function with proper functionality in Linux? We need a proof that software can be trusted and working in the environments that it's supposed to. Usability test. Usability testing is a funny thing because um, as uh, testers and developers, we must presume that users are absolutely the most stupid things in the world. And that if they can fail or miss a button or text or functionality, we must presume that and act accordingly, making sure that it's impossible to miss it or minimizing that possibility. Because users, from the point of view of a tester and developer, are stupid. Not in a bad way, but in a way that if it can happen, if it can be missed, it most likely will. So usability testing basically is a way of just learning more about users through their experience of how they use software for the first time. And through that experience, uncover design problems and improve the design. What issues they had using the software and how should those issues be solved? Compatibility testing is basically system requirements. Does software work under the system requirements it says it does? Are two gigs of RAM enough? Is toaster um, graphics card enough? Is software working under 
uh, another software version X is an Internet Explorer supported for the website. Is it working on Linux as well as Mac as well as other OSs that it says it lists under system requirements? All those things are compatibility testing. And lastly, compliance testing is basically an audit and a double, a way of double checking if the um, software that we have meets the requirements, uh, the standards of the company. There can be double standards for big companies, one for client and second for company itself. Client might just say vaguely that we want this done. But company cannot allow itself to just do it. They have their standards. And if those standards are not met, the compliance test will be failed. It needs to be, it needs to look consistently. It needs to have its logo somewhere for company. It needs to have standard error handling and many other things for compliance testing to pass. <clears throat> And those that were mentioned are basically what the, the kind of tests that you will see and all kinds of tests that you will see in most guides. If you Google it, it will always come with those two categories and more or less with the tests, with the list of tests that you had before. And now I will try to present you some a bit more exotic kind of tests that are not as often used or a technique or a set of techniques that is maybe used, but is not a different test by itself. It, it can simply be a kind of test, but done in its own way. So first one that is extremely important to know is exploratory testing and basically done by testers. It with with a goal in mind to find bugs in software but not by um, going through a defined test plan but by just exploring software and this is a difficult kind of testing because you need to understand and have experience where problems in software usually occur because you cannot afford to just explore software every time you test it. You basically time box yourself and try to do things that you have experience of breaking that normally break. You try to exploit your software in such ways. So one or two hours, you just poke around and try to break it. And if you break it, you did your job well because you found the bug. That's exploratory testing. It's exploratory because it doesn't have a defined plan. You just try to break it in a given set of period, uh, set of time. Architecture test is actually a cool one. And I couldn't find any of this, uh, as an official, um, um, blog post or article on Google really. However, I, managed to find um, both a library and an example of how it's done in .NET for a really cool project, um, Modular Monolith, which demonstrates the main Durin design. And in here we have architecture tests. And let's read it in order to understand it. It says, so we have a bunch of modules and we basically say that our API assembly must reside in this assembly and it should not have dependencies on other modules. So basically what this test does, it verifies if our module is truly in isolation. So because in, in modular design, we don't want uh, dependencies to leak. We, we want, uh, each individual module to not know about one another and architecture tests like this one literally just shows that if all the modules that we have 
are or, or that uh, this given module is not with a dependency to other other modules because it needs to be in isolation so if you want a more uh, architecture examples you can look at this link below chaos monkeys is an interesting technique developed by netflix or coined by netflix it's basically um a way of thinking that if it can break it will break but not only that if it can break it will break and that will happen at the worst possible time what is the worst possible time well would you like waking up at night realizing that your whole system that you developed over three years is now crashing and burning and that you have hundreds of thousands of complaints in your emails and then support is not being able to handle it all how would you like that overnight happening it's ridiculous and basically we don't want that we don't have we cannot afford a person to just stay and observe how the system behaves we want to to simulate so therefore we want to simulate such scenarios in breaking our system and seeing how it can handle it so that we don't have to handle it ourselves when the worst case scenarios happen and the worst time happens we want to protect about disasters about failures about just stuff not working because if it can fail to work and it will and it's not about writing bad code or uh, bad design it's just um the nature of software that it simply breaks unexpectedly however if it breaks it needs to be recovered and uh, like we need a way to recover from it so S chaos monkeys is just a collection of tools and processes that just go and randomly turn off software uh, services uh, break systems in um, in um, with with goal of simply seeing if software can recover from it if our system can recover from it Netflix was the first one who adopted this system because it was one of the first one who went to microservices based architecture. When if a part of a chain breaks, um, it, it might be quite hard to determine, like, every, like distributed system has many different chains. And if a chain breaks, it might be hard to um to investigate it uh, basically the netflix story set was this initially they were a monolith meaning which all their logic was under one running process and it was unscalable also it would fail and if it was failing it would well need fixing and at really horrible times so the went for ways and ways of how to simulate failures and simulate recoveries and they realized that it's really not viable to have it under one process so they split their solution across microservices and the problem still remained but now they could simulate it a bit better because uh, different monkeys could tackle attack different services and simulate uh, the problems and recovery was actually a thing you couldn't really recover as a monolith when it breaks it breaks the whole thing but if you have microservices and multiple instances of the same microservice that is load balanced you can just turn off a, a single service and in theory, there should be other services still running in spot of the one that was shut down. So this is just one example of one chaos monkey that shuts down a service. And this shutting down of service should not break anything. Like the system should still be working.
there's more resources than needed because we take in consideration that it can break individual chain can break yet the whole thing should not break because of that that's the purpose of chaos monkeys bdd is an interesting thing it's a mythology um that is very similar to tdd it's behavior driven development it's um uh, a flow based on given, when, then kind of thing. And it's basically an intersection point of technology and business, of domain knowledge and um, test specification. So we get those two together and we have basically use case tests, um, feature tests that are written in a human-friendly language that anyone can read, but under the hood, we have pro proper code. On the cover, we have something that is literally written in prose that you can read as a non-developer and understand. But under the hood, it's, it's, it's like a template that you need to fill as a developer. And I'll show that in live coding part. And BDD goes well in hand with TDD. Uh, each can be understood as its own loop. But if you add those loops together, you have the following flow. You first write a feature that does not exist. And if a feature is defined, like it's written what it needs to do, but there is no implementation for that. Well, of course, that test will fail for feature. So what do you do next? You implement the feature. How do you implement the feature? You start from a unit test. So you then move on to unit test. You then implement the feature. You then run the test. You see it pass. You refactor the test. And then you go back to the feature test and run the feature test. And when both loops are green, when both iterations are green, I mean, then you can move on to the next feature, next unit test, and rinse and repeat like that. So it integrates really well, it's just a slightly longer loop. But what is the benefit? The benefit is that you get um, a different kind of test. Uh, Behavior-driven development, BDD tests are usually end-to-end uh, -end tests. And they basically test um, uh, a scenario. And therefore we have those given when then so it tests a scenario from start to finish what happens and lastly a very interesting thing we have so many tests and we're still humans and what we automate and tests can still be buggy we can make mistakes but how do we know that what we wrote is what we wrote as a test is actually not a buggy test, but a proper test. <laughs> and the, for, for this reason, we can sometimes look at code and think that code is bad because uh, tests are failing. But in other scenarios, we can look at uh, tests and say that, well, code is good, but tests are bad. How do you know which one is the case? So just like code needs to be tested, so some tests need to be tested as well. And this is called mutation tests. What if we could take some source code and modify it? What happens if we have calculator tests and instead of addition, we have a way of messing up of our code and uh, instead of addition, writing uh, minus sign or multiplication. Should it work? Obviously not. If it's still passing after we uh, made such a change, that means the, tests is, the test is really bad. Like it doesn't really test what it should, right? And therefore mutation testing uh, is a way of pinpointing those issues. And in this example, you can see uh, that we, we have um, 
we, we tested a main method in our program class and we basically verified that the service full method was called, right? And when we tested main method, we also ran through the write line uh, for console as well. But we didn't verify from this from this uh, example, we can tell that we didn't verify if uh, right line was actually called or not. So mutation tests are useful for not just having code coverage or like a percent that says how how many lines of code have been stepped through with our tests, but it also shows if there are lines of code that are irrelevant for test, and then it's like a warning. Why is it irrelevant? Is it really supposed to be irrelevant? And in this example, basically, no matter what string I write, the test will pass. It might be the case, <clears throat> it might be the case, but, um, uh, in in some cases it might be a big issue and maybe mutation survived is not a horrible thing but a bigger thing is when the test succeeds uh the verification test uh, step succeeds so this this one is okay because it was relevant but if if let's say we have a test that tests if we can add two numbers together. And in our test, for some reason, we choose to add zero and zero together. Well, what if we take away zero from zero, multiply zero from zero, it still gives the same output. And our mutation test will fail because, well, if we change zero to one, it should still, um, it shouldn't be working, it shouldn't be passing, yet it will. So it will fail. That's mutation test. And in .NET, we have a library called striker.net. And it's a really cool name because it's a reference to X-Men. Basically, it aims to find and spot all the mutations. Like it tries to apply the mutations in our code and sees if the tests still pass after we made those mutations. The link is in below. If you want to use it, it's just a NuGet package, nothing special that you need to run for console. And I'll demonstrate it in live coding part, how that works. And after the scan, it will look like this. Basically an HTML with a report saying how, what's your mutation score? In other words, how, how many lines and percent uh, um, were mutated and that made the tests fail. So if, <clears throat> if changing all lines of code made tests fail, that's a good thing because, well, changing code breaks tests and the tests are supposed to break. However, if the result is the opposite, if no matter how you change your code, the test still pass, you should reconsider your test. Is it really testing what it should? Maybe, but it should be a warning. So you can see three kinds of uh, results from a scam. It's, it's either uncovered or it's covered and it failed. The test means the mutation was killed or it succeeded the test means the mutation survived. So those are the three kinds of scams that there are. And to summarize everything, if we don't test our code and if we just deal with bugs when we go into production, we will end up looking like this. Shabby developers with little hope in life, always tired and grumpy and blaming testers for our own mistakes. 
So I wish you all to write tests and multiple layers of tests, like not just unit tests, but integration tests as well were uh, um, applicable. Also smoke tests for just having a quick way to check if system is booted. Sanity tests to see if core functionality is working. Uh, E2E tests to see if automated flow that the user does is working. Uh, have a postman suit and have a way to ping your system in an easy way to see if the system works. And in general, appreciate the testers who have a plan and do their job. And we as developers write just a small fraction of tests, like six or seven kinds at most. Uh, the testers do way, way more testing than developer. Anyways, when you have all tests green and you don't ignore the issues, you can truly rest and enjoy the results. And what are the results? Bug-free software or software that has minimal amount of bugs in production. That is all I wanted to show today. Now I'll move on to some um, automation thingies uh, and some demos. Before that, do you have any questions? All right, uh, if that's the case, I'll start from a demo application, a very simple one. We have a calculator. It's a really crappy calculator. As you can see, it's, it works awesome, right? <laughs> Fancy features. Anyways, you basically can click the buttons. So I type one to three, I divide from one to three, the result is one. So you can do multiple operations with it. So it basically takes a string and evaluates the expression. And we need to test this thing. And the problem with this thing was that it was written actually all in Windows forms. It was written all in Windows forms and the, the way it was done, it was also, you see, referring to text box, something that is native to wind forms. Like if we have solution like this written the way it is and referencing components like that, like from Windows forms, we cannot really properly test it in our tests because we need the whole environment of Windows forms. We need Windows. How do we properly test this calculator? How do we test that it does what it should? And one of the answers could be end to end test. And that basically looks like this. If we look at our test of our calculator test, we see, we see this add two numbers returns expected. So one plus two, returns free, subtract two numbers returns expected. So one minus two returns minus one and so on. We have test cases. And the way we test those cases is by interacting with our calculator. And the way I'm testing um, this calculator is through Selenium tests or to be precise with Appium tests. It's a branch of Selenium that is specifically used for testing either mobile or Windows uh, desktop applications. How does it work? Let's try and run it. So I have a test suit just like any other and I'll hit run button and let's see what happens. Right. The test failed and let's see the error message. It says, 
um, unable to connect to remote server, no connection could be made because the target machine actively refused this IP. Uh, what this means in a nutshell, that I need to actually be running um, a process which listens and intercepts my input. So I need to go here, something like tools. Uh, yikes. Something like tools, windows. Windows application driver. Windows application driver is uh, an exe that is able to intercept user input. So let's run it. And you see, it basically listens to all that the UI does at the given IP, at the given port. Let's run our tests again and see what's going on. I, I highlighted that and so it was failing to respond. Sorry about that. Let's run again. Uh, I think I have the thing open, so it's malfunctioning. Let me, let me try again. Oops. Uh, cannot open file specified. Okay. Uh, actually, I don't know why. Uh, it might be because I accidentally cleaned the solution. So let's rebuild it and make sure we have an exe in the bin folder. We have an, an exe in the bin folder. Bootcamp dummy app calculator. And let's make sure that we are trying to open the same, uh, the same uh, yeah, the, the same uh, program. So here, here is the issue. The issue is the path. I took this from my old lesson, so it was clean code series. It's, not, it's no longer clean code series. It's actually uh, dummy apps bootcamp, the dummy app calculator, and I'm not even sure if that's needed. Uh, let's look at the path again. Source, dummy apps, calculator, bin, debug, and the exe. Source, dummy apps, bin, debug, that's the exe. Okay. We fixed the path. Let's run the tests again with the focus of that window. Oh God. Okay. The easiest way to check if the path is right is just entering it in the Explorer and see if it opens. It doesn't open, so we made a mistake. Let's see where we made a mistake. We made a mistake there. Let's see what's the last thing that got that we got correct. That is correct. Okay, so let's take this path right there and paste it all the way to there. It should be fine now. Let's run it again. All right. So now you can see how it interacts uh, with the calculator. And now you can see that all tests passed. Let's run it again and try to understand what happens. Every test has a uh, Force five steps essentially. And the five steps that there are is one, press one number, press operation key, press second number, press equality sign, and then clean up. Let's run again. So it's literally just the flow that you would do manually when, when testing calculator. What do you do? You basically press the operation you want, you, you hit uh, equal sign and you clean. 
uh, the screen so that you can proceed with the next operation. And in code, it looks quite simple. <clears throat> it basically says, uh, find the, uh, find, uh, if we open the calculator itself, it says, find button by, or, or any UI element by its display. So it, it looks at the first number and it finds this button and it clicks it. And it, it does the same for every single element. So it finds number one button, it clicks it. It finds number uh, two button, it clicks it. It takes any operation button and it clicks it. So it does this and it then presses equality button as you can see here. And then in the end, uh, we take the results from the text box and we verify if the results that are actual are as expected. And after every test is run, we find the C button and clean the display so that other tests can run. And actually when we're done with the whole thing, we just say and uh, dispose the driver, which basically means we close the driver. So let's run again now that you know how it works. Button operation equals clear screen. And you can see that in the end, it just closes itself. So there is that. Uh, and this is desktop testing. Um, there is a tool called uh, Windows Inspector. I'm not sure if I have it, to be honest. I probably don't have it because it needs uh, Windows SDK, Windows uh, Software Development Toolkit. So at the moment, I probably don't have it. But basically, uh, it's a tool that allows you to hit F F12 and click a button that lets you inspect uh, IDs of an element, text, position and other other different things based on which you you can test it what what i have here what i have here actually technically works for everything uh sorry this thing that i have here technically works for any windows application it doesn't even be, have to be my own for example i can automatically paint I can automatically type the notepad and so on. It works everywhere. So there, there is that. Now, another uh, kind of test that I wanted to show is the behavior driven development. And let's look how the test looks like, shall we? Uh, so we have feature. It's just one simple feature. <clears throat> so this is just a plain text description of the feature. And it reads like this. The feature is greeter, right? And it reads like this. In order to do a demo, I need to greet people first so that we avoid any rude reactions. And uh, now the template for this feature is as follows. Given I have selected a language, English, when I greet a person with a name Tom, then the result should be hello Tom. Basically, it means it greets people by their name in language with hello in, in the language of selection. So what this means is that if I run the code, let's verify that it works. Uh, where the hell is the feature? It's running tests somewhere, somehow. I don't know where, I don't know how. Uh, let's rebuild it sometimes. Sometimes doesn't pick up tests. Come on. Hmm. 
run tests. Come on, do something. Hmm. Am I having... Oh, here we go. It was just a different window. Okay. So here you see the test passed. And if we uh, look at it, there's nothing special. Uh, but you can see that there are two things, a feature and some spec run evaluation. So what this thing is actually, it's called specflow, the library that I'm using. And it basically allows us to automate this specification through a template that gets generated by, based on the scenario that we wrote for greet person. So greet person feature actually has greeter steps and those steps look like this. Uh, just like we wrote in the, uh, this thing, let's have two screens so that we can compare. Okay. Here we can see those three essential parts given when then. So given this text, when this input, then result. Um, it's, it's very much like we write our unit tests, or at least like I tried to teach you guys how you write unit tests, is that you have a precondition, uh, input, and final result. Though in, in unit tests, it's not so verbose as, as it is uh, in uh, BDD tests. Uh, in uh, use case tests, in uh, E3 tests. But basically you can understand what it does. Given I have selected the language English, when I greet a person with a name that is given, the, then the selected result should be the expectation. Uh, and we have our greeter class and it basically does this. If it's English, it says hello. If it's Lithuanian, it says Labas. And then when we greet a person, it first prints hello in the language of our choice and then the name comma name exclamation mark. So this one might not be so impressive. It's just a different way of testing. And this actually is used uh, maybe not too often, but in some workplaces it's, it's being practiced successfully and it's just a uh, a better way of, you know, getting business people and testers together. And actually who can write a feature like this? Who can write a feature like this? Basically anyone, even a business person, business analyst, a tester then converts this to test and implements that. Uh, more often than not, testers write feature tests and not developers, at least from my experience. But there's nothing that says that developer cannot write those. So that's fine. Yeah, there's that. Uh, next one that I wanted to show and actually two more that is left is the, the demo of an amazing website that I made. Um, so let's run the website. It's a really silly website that has almost no functionality, it has a home page and a greeter page. So you input in input box your name and I'll say Kaizenal. You say greet and it just prints your name. Absolutely unimpressive, but it serves the purpose of being a dummy application and being testable. So here I have this thingy called Catalan Recorder and what this allows me to do, it allows me to test my application. So 
how would I know that my application is working? Like imagine you wrote some functionality, you improved something, you refactored code. How do I know that if I click read button with a given name, it still says hello Kaizeno. How do I know? I will, what do I do? I run the application. I go to greeter tab. I type my name. I click the greet button. I read what it says and I'm happy. I just wasted 20 seconds of my life testing functionality like this. And instead I can simply record my clicks and replay them. So this Catalan recorder does exactly that. I can record my interactions with the browser and play them back. In this example, let's hit the play button. Uh, let's read the test suit first. Greet when Kaizeno alerts hello Kaizeno. So let's make sure that it works. So I close the browser, the, the website, and uh, let's play back the test. So it went. <laughs> It went to the website, it clicked the tab we wanted, it typed my name, it checked the alert box, it closed it, it verified it was correct. Done. And you can see the test is green. How do I make sure that it failed? Let's, uh, let's make the test failed. I changed that my name is Kaizena, not Kaizenel. And if I play it back again, how does it look like if it failed? Sorry, sorry for the for the selection. How does it look like if it if it failed? Well, as you can see, it's red now. So we can see that it didn't have a flashy effect of big green light, but it's still some indicator that test passes or fails. Um, let's try to just do the same thing again. How do we uh, add a uh, a new test method, add new test case. Here we go, test. So I demonstrate how simple it is to do what I just did, right? You hit the record button, you click on the tab you want, or I'm just doing the steps. Imagine you are on the website. You clicked on the tab, you clicked on the box, Am I recording by the way? I am. So you clicked on the box, you typed Kaizeno, you hit greet, hello Kaizeno, you select it as a way of verifying it and you hit okay. And stop, done. My test is recorded. Let's play it back. It actually played it back in a different browser, uh, in, a, in a different window. So let, let, let me try again. So here, boom, boom, Isono, assert, again, green. As you can see, how long it took me to record a test with interactions? Seconds. The same seconds I, I took to click it. And I can go as far as just running all tests, the whole suit. So it just runs everything multiple times, all my test methods, and you can see it passed. My last test, by the way, was to just go to homepage and verify that uh, a user is welcomed. So to verify if the header one here uh, was welcome to dummy app, as you can see here. It's really easy. And next step for this, you can click even export button and select C sharp. Unfortunately, there is no X unit, but you can select C sharp and boom, it converts this test into C sharp language in code. Instead of just vague uh, scripts, it has a code. So you can save to a file, drag it to your application, and here you have it, your tests recorded, played back and the script generated from them. You can quickly convert that to an XUnit if you want, and boom, done. So that is a recorded and played back tests. And one last thing, the mutation tests example. 
Um, so I have uh, already installed a NuGet package uh, in this uh, test project. Actually, I think it's not per project, it's global. Like if you install it once, you have it forever across all projects. Uh, striker, if I type striker, you can see um, this one. Uh, a tool to run the tests in a command line and I can install this as many times as I want. Nothing will happen. No nugget will appear. It's global. You can install it per project, but I'm fine with having it global. So next thing what you need to do is to run this command .NET striker minus minus test projects and select the projects you're running the tests for. And I'm running the tests for this project specifically. This one. What tests do I have and what code am I testing before we show an example? Uh, actually, oh crap. Okay, great. So what tests are we running? We have a trivial, two trivial tests. First, if we look at our chapter, we have the dummy service and we call a dummy service. What does a dummy service do? Well, it just says foo. Uh, I mean, when foo gets called, bar is printed. Very simple, nothing special. And uh, basically we call a service uh, and after that we print hello world. And on top of that, we have animals. That's another kind of thing that we do. So animals can talk, 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 talk. Um, Animal by default says nothing. Uh, cat says meow. Lion says raw. A wolf says awu, and so on. And we test those things. So our tests are here. Here we have them. Basically, um, a new animal talk returns empty. Cat talk returns meow. Lion talk returns raw, wolf talk returns awu. If we run the tests, they all pass, but that doesn't mean that everything is uh, properly tested, right? Uh, so if we run the tests, they pass, as you can see here. But if we run our mutation tests, it will show more problems in our tests that we have. Uh, as a way of peaking our attention, concentrating and focusing it to problematic places. So it looks for projects to mutate. You can have it for one project, multiple projects, doesn't matter as much. It finds the tests and runs them after corrupting stuff. And it then generates a report of what happened with your tests. How did they behave after being corrupted? And it shows how they were corrupted. So this is the report that it generates. And uh, the first report, the worst score is is here uh, probably well basically this part basically it says this line was covered in the code because of course we tested it we tested it here when calling main we also call this line, but this line by itself was not verified. And this might be fine. And it is fine in this case, but the test just uh, piques our attention that look, you had this line of code, you changed it, nothing changed in your tests. Is it really supposed to be like that? In this case, yes. So that's fine. Let's carry on. Let's move on to examples dummy service. And here we basically uh, changed this to empty string, nothing changed, and it wasn't even tested. So 
it's untested that's bad it's a problem lastly we have animals and for animals it's a different story uh, we have a mutation what happens if uh, our animal our default animal instead of uh, returning an empty string it returns striker was there the test will fail so the mutation was killed because it killed the test and that is a good thing it broke the test means it's working and the same for all tests like if i replace meow with an empty string the test breaks and so on and so forth And that is all I wanted to show for this lesson, I think. Do you have any questions? Uh, this lesson, by the way, is just for um, informational and educational purposes. There is nothing that I will ask you to do from it in terms of homework because all those things, they're just nice to know, but absolutely not necessary for knowing how to implement. It's just nice to know, like as an educated programmer, you should be aware of those things, but you by no means need to know how to implement or uh, practice any of those other than unit and integration testing. So, yep, uh, that is all I had for this lesson then, and thank you for your attention. See you next time. Uh, next time I'm, I'm making a break. So uh, one week, no lessons. Next lesson, uh, we'll start a new chapter and that is solid. And that will happen in uh, one week. And solid chapter, we have five lessons at least. And that will happen in one week and a half. So see you and bye-bye.